Podcastle, episode 829, for Tuesday the 5th of March 2024. A double feature, comprising When the Giants Came Through the Valley, by Derek Bowden, and Floaters, by Kevin Sandifer, as read by J.S. Arquin and Danny Daly respectively, and produced by Devin Martin. Rated PG-13, with content warnings before each story. Good morning, good day, good afternoon and good evening and welcome to Podcastle, the flying castle of fancy fiction. I'm your host Matt Dovey and it's my delight to deliver for your enjoyment a double bill of stories. First up is When the Giants Came Through the Valley by Derek Bowden, as narrated by J.S. Arquin. This story was previously published by Lightspeed Magazine, April 2023, and has a content warning for references to suicide and parental death. Derek Bowden's fiction has appeared in Lightspeed, Clark's World, Analog and elsewhere. Derek is a Sturgeon Award nominated writer, a software developer, an adventurer and a graduate of the Clarion West class of 2019. He currently calls Boston his home, although he's lived in 14 cities spanning four continents. He is owned by two cats and one Iron World daughter. Find him at DerekBowden.com and on Twitter at, at DerekBowden. When J.S. Arquin was three years old, he'd carry a stack of books to the nearest adult and demand they read them all to him. When they finished, he'd fetch another stack. Thus began a lifelong obsession with books and the written word. These days, J.S. is a full-time narrator with over 150 audiobooks recorded. I guess you could say he's paying all those green eggs and ham forward. He's especially chuffed to be narrating for podcasts this week, as this means he has now narrated stories for all four Escape Artists podcasts which has been a dream of his for years. You can find him on Instagram and Facebook as Arquin Audiobooks and on his website www.arquinaudiobooks.com And now pay attention, for our tale is about to begin and it's time we told it to each other instead of just listening to what we're told. When the Giants Came Through the Valley by Derek Bowden When the giants came through the valley, they made footprints, as long as the Santa Monica Promenade, as wide as Dodger Stadium. They crushed dance studios, Cato cafes, a water park. They left trails of steep-sided ravines with walls of stratified clay and crumbling asphalt. And this is where we now live. Sunset comes earlier down here, but it could be worse. Our footprint is deep and arid and full of retooled strip malls. We dwell in the remains of footlockers and tiki bars, tag our names out front in bold blue letters, Lazy Stan, Carmencita, Hot Hot Henry. We didn't all live here before the giants came through. We're a product of collective chance. Grinding out another two-hour commute, heading for happy hour at the village after working another double, the third this week. Some of us still have homes topside, in buildings the giants happen to miss. But that's neither here nor there. The footprint is our home now. No two footprints are the same. Ours doesn't have much going for it, aside from a surprisingly fertile heel wall, good for growing grapes, which has come in handy considering how the airdrops never include any wine. A few footprints down, they struck oil, bleeding through the cracks in that old giant soul stamp. Most people topside say the footprints are a blemish, an embarrassment. Not that one. Excavators moved in overnight, kicked everyone out. The grapes are our little secret. When the giants came through the valley, they shed all manner of alien creatures. Land-crawling octopuses shaken from the hairs of their feet. Huge spiders jettisoned from their vast dreadlocks. Razor-toothed frogs that are 90% mouth. They scuttled about in a daze, like us, before aggressively laying claim to whatever residence they could find. The dusty asphalt crags of a basketball court, 
the Ethernet cable jungle of a ruined server farm. Most of them are herbivores, <laughs> lucky us. Tomas took it upon himself to sort out which ones weren't. He had a good run. We're thankful for his contributions. Topsiders have a rule. Anything that breaches the surface that isn't human, kill it. Down here, though, it's live and let live. Sure, the critters aren't always pleasant, but who can blame them? They're just like us, clinging to some dispassionate monolith our whole lives because we're all too scared to let go, even as it stomps and stomps and stomps on everything we've ever known. Until finally, through exhaustion or the sheer loss of will, we just can't hold on anymore. So, we let go. When the giants came through the valley, they caught everyone unaware. Where did they come from? The moon? Mars? Bakersfield? Did they rise from an age-old slumber deep within the crust of the earth? Perhaps we'll never know. The governor deployed the National Guard, but it was too little too late. By the time the Harriers howled in with their little man braggadocio, the giants were gone. They marched straight into the Pacific Ocean without ever looking back, until all we could see, those of us with any view at all, were the forested tops of their heads. Then a ripple of sea foam, and then nothing. When the giants came through the valley, they left pieces of us behind. Benny was a customer service associate at a telecom company, where he'd worked for 12 years and had been passed up for promotion 12 times. He didn't have that spark, they explained to him. He made $2 above minimum wage, lived in a loft by the docks where he kept old takeout containers on hand to catch the drips from the ceiling when it rained, which was never frequent enough to warrant the landlord's attention. He'd never been late for a shift and had never taken a vacation. On his last day of work, the day the giants came through, he had been called a money-grubbing cockswallow, a capitalist goon, and a script-reading dick wreath. On none of these occasions had he deviated from his list of approved responses. When he looked at himself in the mirror that morning, he still couldn't find that spark. When the giants came through the valley, they left two kinds of survivors, evacuees and everyone else. They airlifted the first lot within the week. The rest of us, well... News crews periodically buzz down in their helicopters. They think this thing we're doing is a movement. Living low, they call it. And us? Lowlifes. They seem desperate for us to buy into the notion, to justify what would otherwise be madness. They always ask the same questions. Why are you still down here? You know you don't have to stay, right? We offer assorted reasons. Lower rent, fewer sunburns, no parking tickets. But it's all bullshit, and the reporters leave wearing the grimaces of beleaguered parents. So why are we still down here? Politicians watch the news with an ear for worst-case scenarios. Pretty soon, movement starts to sound an awful lot like protest. They talk a lot about waiting us out, and breaking us up. But what is it they think we're protesting? And how could this possibly help? Some developers put together a plan to fill in the footprints with sand from Palmdale, cover them in glass domes, turn them into high-end novelty spas. Maybe someday they'll have their way. Until then, we accept our monthly airdrop of rations graciously, though we don't really need it. Shayna's garden is a thing of wonder, and it turns out the eggs from those razor-toothed frogs are pretty tasty with a little salt. What we're doing, I suppose, is living. Just a little farther down. 
Jamie was a middle manager at an insurance company, where he averaged 60-hour weeks. His job was to deny claims. A single approved claim would cost him his entire monthly bonus. His boss punched down, so Jamie did the same. Because that's how you get ahead, and getting ahead is the dream. Besides, he was doing his team a solid, keeping them productive, keeping them employed. With the right amount of pressure, Trish might get that raise. Rama might finally make assistant manager. And boy, would they ever thank Jamie when they did. Jamie had been smoking more every day. It was an expensive habit, sure, but it helped with the stress, and he earned a bonus after all. By the time the Giants came through, he was up to three packs a day. He took his smoke breaks in the back alley, where they tossed the shredded remains of incriminating paper trails into the big green dumpsters. Until, on that particular morning, a few hours before the Giants came through, when he stepped outside and promptly tripped over Rama, who happened to be lying face down in a sticky morass of his own blood. The body looked deflated from the ten-story jump that had pulped his bones. When the giants came through the valley, they never once looked down. Did they even know we were here? <laughs> Did they care? Were we that inevitable trail of ants, trampled on the way to the beach? Or... Was this a deliberate act? Some survivors prayed it was malicious. Better to be spurned than ignored. Those were the survivors who left. The ones who stayed? We know better. Giants rarely spare a thought for what's underfoot. Anna cobbled shifts at three dishwashing gigs to make rent. Kept her garnished tips in a coffee tin under her bed because... She couldn't get a bank account ever since her ex-husband wrote those bad checks to pay off his gambling debts. Three years later, she'd saved enough for a flight to Guatemala to visit her mother in hospice. On her way to the bank for a money order, the day before the giants came through, LAPD pulled her over. When she handed the officer her documents, his cold blue eyes lingered on the cash that plumped her wallet. He noticed a discrepancy with her immigration papers, brought her to the precinct. Eight hours later, he let her go. The money in her wallet was gone. Her mother passed the next morning. The night after the giants came through, we huddled around a barrel fire outside the pitted remains of a once-hip boba cafe, a host of alien creatures scuttling madly beyond the shadows. Tiny flames pitted Anna's brooding eyes. She folded her hands neatly in her lap and said, I'm done. There were nods all around. When the giants came through the valley, they left us all behind. What a cruel trick. None of us thought to grab hold and hang on. Where would we have ended up if we had? Surely someplace better, we thought at the time. Now... Months later, as we sit around the barrel fire that has become our town hall, we harbor no such thoughts. We're not interested in the worlds of giants. We're lowlifes, and we always keep an eye on where we step. And welcome back. That was When the Giants Came Through the Valley by Derek Bowden. And if you enjoyed that, he's had three stories over on a skate pod before now. Episode 897, Migratory Patterns of the Modern American Skyscraper. Episode 766, The Unrepentant. And episode 721, Hustle. There's a whole bunch more on his website too, DerekBowden.com. And that's spelt D-E-R-R-I-C-K-B-O-D-E-N.com. Derek had this to say about when the giants came through the valley. This story was born from a daydream I had about whole ecosystems thriving in the footsteps of giants who've passed through. Once I decided to set the story in the modern era, it seemed natural that a story about giants, and what they leave behind, 
should be a critique on American capitalism. Of course, the story wouldn't be half of what it is without the always on point feedback of my Clarion West and Codex friends. Thank you, Derek, for the story and the thoughts. Our second story of the day is Floaters by Kevin Sandifer, narrated for you by longtime Escape Horses contributor Danny Daly. This story was previously published by Pulp Literature Magazine, August 2022, and has a content warning for hospitalisation. Kevin Sandifer is the Capital Projects Accountant for the Champaign Unit 4 School District, and is currently pursuing a Bachelor of Applied Studies in Creative Writing at the University of Iowa. His fiction has appeared, or is forthcoming in, the Saturday Evening Post, Pulp Literature and Metastella. He lives with his wife and two cats in Champaign County, Illinois, which is a magical place where miracles happen almost every day, and hardly anyone seems to find that remarkable. Danny Daly is a jack of many trades, master of none. But seeing as she loves the rogue life, that's okay with her. You can hear stories she's narrated in all four Escape Artists podcasts, Starship Sofa, Glittership and Asimov Science Fiction podcast. Or you can buy the audiobook she's narrated at audible.com under the name Danielle Daly. Now pay attention, for our tale is about to begin. And you won't want to forget such a remarkable series of events. Floaters by Kevin Sandifer Read by Danny Daly If you're asking me, did I know Zeke Fido? I'd have to say no, not really. Except, of course, in the biblical sense. But that's probably not what you meant. The reporters all called him the man who believed he could fly, which was the title of that special they did on him. But I wasn't in it much, which is just fine by me if anyone's asking. Which I guess you kind of are. You may not believe this, since hardly anybody mentions him much anymore. But for a while there, they couldn't talk about anything else. I met Zeke during the Year of the Floaters, which is obviously where he got the idea. The Institute had the very first dedicated ward for them, and Zeke and I both worked there as night shift nurses. He was good at his job, always there to help before you called, always efficient and professional. I appreciated that. But, mostly, I just thought he was drop-dead gorgeous. I couldn't take my eyes off him as we moved from bed to bed, loosening each patient's restraints so they could drift up to eye level for the doctor's morning rounds. He clearly cared deeply about all of our patients. You could tell by the way he moved around them, gently easing them upwards so they wouldn't jerk at the end of their straps. When we'd get to the end of the room, we would wait together, standing by in case the doctors needed anything. They shepherded their interns through the ward, pretending to examine each patient. (laughs) You know how they are, peering under the floating bodies like they might discover for the first time what nobody else had seen yet. Namely, what was holding these people up in the middle of the air? You already know they never did figure it out. Not after all the tissue samples, and blood draws, and image scans, and what simple tests they were allowed to run on the living. After a while, they gave up. They never had all that much to go on anyway. Just a bunch of patients in comas, who no longer felt compelled to obey gravity. My theory was that it was supposed to be the rapture, but heaven was full, so the rest had to stay here. Zeke called my idea the napture. His own theory was more elegant. He thought they were all dreaming they were flying. And that gave them the faith they needed to float. When I asked him how that was possible, he said it wasn't. But there they were anyway. Proof positive once and for all that people could fly. And there we were, still taking care of them, long after the intern stopped coming and the doctors made fewer and fewer visits, and the news cycles moved on to the next big thing, and the public lost interest. For a while, the bodies just kept coming, and I wondered if we'd have to open another ward, since we only had 50 beds on the top floor. 
but they stopped once we got to 47. We never did fill those last few beds. Zeke and I would use them for catnaps or to update charts. Sometimes, in the middle of the night, we'd use them for other things. Neither of us made that much noise, and besides, the floaters never seemed to mind. On those nights, when it was just the two of us, Zeke would go around and loosen all their restraints again to let the patients rise up a few feet. He said it was to prevent bed sores, but I think he really just liked the idea of them hovering, the marvel of it. When they were up off their beds like that, they bobbed up and down in our wake whenever we walked past, surfing an invisible ocean. Sometimes Zeke would open a window to air out the ward, and if there was a breeze, the patients would wave back and forth like a field of flowers. Zeke actually called them wave people, which he thought was more respectful than just floaters. He felt a real bond with them, and after a while so did I. I envied their calm and their peace. Their faces all relaxed with that expression morticians always try for, but never quite get. We drifted through most of the summer that way, lost in our own private garden of flotsam and dreams. Until the night, one of the doctors came back at the start of our shift and told us that the ward was being closed, and the patients all transferred to a new research facility for long-term study and that we should get them all ready to move in the morning. Zeke didn't take that well at all. He stewed about it most of the night. He hated the idea of our patients, our patients, being locked in a basement of some government lab, strapped down while somebody opened them up and took them apart and poked around inside, maybe even while they were still being kept alive. Hearts pumping away, lungs breathing stale, antiseptic air. I asked him what we could do, but I guess I already knew the answer, because he didn't say anything, just stared at me and hypnotized me with that smile, that beautiful, beautiful smile that said, let's do this, you know you want to. The next thing I remember, we were loosening the straps on the patients, unplugging their IVs and monitors and catheters, moving as quickly as we could from one to the next, freeing them from the bonds of medical society. They drifted slowly to the ceiling, straps hanging loose from their sides, until the room was full of floating bodies. Zeke opened the French doors at the end of the ward, and we stepped out onto the small balcony. The sky was already getting lighter in the east. I peeked over the railing and spotted the ground floor doorway, some fifty feet directly below us, where I knew there would be security guards. At least they weren't outside. Zeke and I looked at each other one last time as if to ask whether we were sure. <sighs> so much for our med careers. We drew each patient slowly by their straps to the opening, pulling them down slightly one at a time to bob through the doorframe like bouquets of get-well balloons, and then out to the balcony. Once we released them, each patient rose into the night sky, lit only from below by the lights in the parking lot. Above the level of the roof, the morning breeze pushed them slowly toward the dawn. We had three or four of them on their way, before the first one drifted far enough out that the guards on the first floor could see them through the doors. I heard the guards come outside and shout up at us, so I knew we didn't have much time. Zeke locked the doors to the ward, but they opened outward, so there really wasn't any way to barricade them. We started grabbing patients two or three at a time, and queuing them up in the center of the room like our own little Macy's parade, then took turns running with each one down the length of the aisle and launching them from the balcony. 
The pounding on the doors kept getting louder, and we kept moving faster, until we both grabbed the last patient and sprinted together through the French doors, catching ourselves on the railing and knocking a flower pot over the edge as we flung our last charge skyward. The clay pot exploded on the pavement below, just missing a guard and making a perfect debris star of dirt and flowers and shards. The floaters drifted higher and higher into the morning clouds, glowing softly on their way toward the sunrise. Zeke asked me where I thought they would go, but I didn't have any idea. Up, I guessed. The ward doors sounded like they were coming apart when Zeke turned to me and said the thing I probably knew was coming. We should go with them, he said. I wondered how. He said we could do it the same way as the floaters. We just needed to believe. I told him I was sorry, but I didn't think I could. That's when the doors at the other end of the ward finally burst open and the security guards came pouring through. Zeke looked at me and nodded, and then he smiled. One last, breathtaking, all-encompassing Zeke smile. He kissed me on the forehead and then, with a wink, he vaulted over the railing. You know the rest. And welcome back. That was Floaters by Kevin Sandifer. And if you enjoyed that, he's not been at Escape Passes before, but after some diligent application of Google Foo on your behalf, I have discovered you can search for Kevin Sandifer Author on Facebook to find his author page there, and then there's a link to a Google Doc spreadsheet in his bio, with all his other stories linked for you. Kevin had this to say about his story. Floaters was born out of a growing sense on my part that we, as a species, seem to be increasingly capable of normalising even the most remarkable events and circumstances, no matter how outlandish they might initially appear, on our way towards ultimately forgetting them entirely. Thank you, Kevin, for the story and the thoughts. These two were, you will probably be unsurprised to hear after two years of my nonsense, entirely my jam. The little folk getting forgotten by people who think us beneath them, who don't think twice to look where they're stepping as they charge through our lives, who consider us only when we pique their curiosity. Goodness me, if that ain't a cheap theme of my thinking these past 15 years since I graduated into a global market crash and witnessed my government commit to an economic principle that seems predicated, largely, on how it can make their rich mates richer at the expense of the rest of us. I am obsessed with all the absurd ways you can put a billionaire's wealth into perspective. Earning a dollar a second gets you a thousand in 16 minutes, a million in 12 days, but it takes 31 years to get to a billion. The average US salary is about 54k a year, and if you'd earned that since Homo sapiens first walked the earth, you'd still only be 10% as rich as Jeff Bezos. You'd have had to earn it every day since the Mesopotamians first planted wheat to match his net worth. I tried to write this next thought more politely, so I'm sorry for my failure, but there is, truly, only one way to express it. Who the fuck needs that much? Needs it so much as drivers have to urinate in bottles rather than risk stopping and delaying the Bezos profit conveyor belt for even two minutes. Craves it so desperately that his workers are harangued by management within two minutes for a mistake, but can then go 20 minutes before anyone notices they've had a heart attack. And those are just the people directly employed. There are whole companies that Amazon have run out of business by simply bringing their capital to bear to undercut them out of existence, because God forbid precious Mr Bezos should ever have to share anything. And I am picking on him as a target here, though I'm sure he'll be fine and not even notice me underfoot. But there's a whole class just like him, who consider the rest of us as naught more than statistics. The most telling phrase in all of corporate culture is human resources. We are not a resource. We are lives, stories, emotions and movements and hopes and dreams and mistakes and good gods if the big guys won't acknowledge our existence and I use a gendered term deliberately and accurately, let's be honest, 
it is up to us to see each other. To not get angry at the person in the call centre who is exhausted from their second job last night because this one doesn't pay enough. To be a little more patient when someone snaps at us because they are overwhelmed. To treat each other with the kindness and respect that the system has discarded as non-quantifiable and unprofitable. Because once we lose that, what's the point? Maybe we should try to stop ourselves normalising the absurdly rich as an acceptable and expected part of our society when every single one of us ought to recoil in horror at the greed and selfishness that takes. That was our show for this week. On behalf of everyone at Podcastle, your co-editors Shingai Enjoro Kagunda and Eleanor Arwood, assistant editor Caitlin Zavanovich, audio engineers Devin Martin and Eric Valdez, and our many wonderful first readers, Andrew Cahoe, Craig Jackson, Amalia Harrington, Julia Pat, Kieran Corsini, Ryan Cole, Sarah S. Messenger, Shrikripa Krishna Prasad, Tarva Nova, Tierney Bailey, Zeev Witties, and myself, Matt Dovey. Thank you for letting us share another story with you. The Legal Bit Podcastle is part of the Escape Artist Foundation, a 501c3 non-profit, and this episode is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International Licence. That means you can share it, and please do, but you cannot sell it, and you cannot change it. If you want specifics, check creativecommons.org. Our music is by Shiva in Exile. Everything we do on Podcastle is 100% donor-funded, and if you'd like to support what we and the rest of EA do, please join us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash eapodcast. Prefer another method? There's details for supporting us via Twitch, Amazon Prime, Kofi and PayPal on escapeartist.net. We'll be back next Tuesday with another fantastic tale. In the meantime, you might care to check out our sister podcasts, Escape Pod for Science Fiction, Pseudopod for Horror, Cast of Wonders for YA Speculative Fiction, and Cat's Cast for Speculative Cat Stories. If your heart belongs to us though, we'll see you next week. Be safe and be kind. <laughs>